Welcome to Do Beautiful Things. I'm your host, Jenny Lawson, President and CEO of Keep America Beautiful. In this podcast, we'll discuss ending litter, the truth behind recycling, and making communities beautiful for people and for a more sustainable future. We'll be talking to industry experts, community leaders, and everyday people who want to do the right thing, including from time to time, my mother. Thank you for joining us. I hope you learned something, and I know I will. Welcome back to Do Beautiful Things, and thank you for joining us for our third episode of the Recycling Reality Check series, where we answer questions uh, with the experts around uh, that we all have around recycling and what we need to know to make more informed decisions about how and what to recycle. If you're new here, the Recycling Reality Check series will explore various aspects of recycling and ways to eliminate the idea of waste, which is the mission of our next guest. I am happy to be here today with my friend, Tom Sasaki, who's the president and CEO at TerraCycle. Tom has made it a mission, a passion, a life to eliminate waste and to eliminate how we think about waste in our economy. And I certainly talked about this on last week's podcast, and um, I cannot think of a better person who changed how I think about this topic and to have a conversation today with Tom about how we can all think differently about throwing things away because nothing goes away. It goes somewhere and, and where it goes and what you do then is really what the conversation is all about. So as a freshman at Princeton University in the early 2000s, Tom had the idea to help eliminate waste by turning worm poop into plant food. It spawned the start of TerraCycle, a company that is now internationally known as an innovator in sustainable solutions and product uh, recovery and reuse. And so, Tom, I am delighted to have you here today. Thanks so much for having me. So let's start there, right? Let's start about uh, at the beginning of, you know, the what inspired TerraCycle and a little bit about the journey that you and the company have been on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, at, a, at a young age, I mean, in my freshman year of, of undergrad, uh, I became really fascinated with, well, first, the idea of how can business be a purpose, uh, an engine for purpose and, and to do good, not just to be a vehicle that maximizes profit. So I was really, I mean, I was in love with entrepreneurship from a young age. I fell in love with the concept of uh, waste, not not waste itself, but just the weirdness of it and how important it is to solve. And it's been a, a lifelong fascination. I mean, isn't it interesting that one day everything will be waste. One day the waste management industry will, as a result, own everything we possess. And in fact, 99% of what we buy will be property of a garbage company within the year of purchase. It's also a material that we pay to get rid of. In fact, in some countries like Japan, that is the legal definition of waste. It's a commodity that we will pay. We don't want it so much. We will pay someone to take it away from us. And yet it's not a natural idea. And it was only really invented in the 1950s, you know, when uh, really things started being made from incredible complex materials. But of course, nature doesn't have systems for those. And we have started and we started consuming at a rate never, ever seen before in humanity. And there's lots of these sort of uh, uh, anomalies to it. But, you know, uh, it, it's been something that is this idea that should not exist. And it's with us. And I hope it doesn't stay with us too long because it, it probably cannot sustain in the long run. Um you know, for us, you know, mentioned in the introduction, uh, worm poop, you know, we had very humble roots, right? Our, our, the first foray into waste solutions was quite literally taking uh, cafeteria food waste uh, from the university, feeding it to worms, taking the resulting worm poop, liquefying it into a tea, and then packaging it in new soda bottles. I actually have our first one here. This is a uh, Terra Cycle, because even the logo was intended, I drew it as a worm, originally in Terra Earth Cycle, hence worm poop. This is our little friendly worm right here. And it's packaged in quite literally used soda bottles, like this is an old uh, Coke bottle. And that's how, that's how we began. Where I'm sitting now was all worm poop bottling. Uh, and... Uh, you know, we had uh, we grew it, you know, over four years to a good size worm poop business. Uh, but we realized that if we make our business hero the product as a product company, we're going to be choosing even if we're going to make a product from waste, the very best waste out there. And so about four years into our business, we said we have to not make the output our business hero, the product, but the input waste. And so we retrain we transformed the whole organization into effectively what, what we have uh, become today, which is a global company operating now in 20 countries, focusing on how do we recycle things that are not recyclable? How do we help companies make their products from hard to recycle materials? 
all the way to how do we shift from recycling to reusable. And uh, that's where we are today now, 20 years later. You know, it, it's really interesting because, you know, a lot of the motivation for this segment of Do Beautiful Things has been around this idea that recycling doesn't work and it's broken and the, and and it's not worth the time or trouble. But I think you're proving a case that it may actually be well worth the time and trouble, right? Like it's a it's a commodity in a limited commodity world. And and I think that's a really important distinction and would love for you to talk a little bit about how yeah. you think about waste in, in in your business planning and cycle and your relationship to, to people and companies. Absolutely. Well, let's begin with the very beginning part of the statement. There's a lot of, you know, sort of narrative out there, if you will, in the media about how like recycling is broken and doesn't work. I think the issue is not that it's broken, it's people don't understand what it is and how it functions, right? So the first bounding question, you know, to ask in that sort of exercise is what really makes something recyclable? And we've surveyed citizens in our insights department all over the world. And what citizens come back with is they say, what makes something recyclable if it can be? And then if there's like available infrastructure and end markets, those would be sort of the next layers of that, of that statement. But that actually isn't the case. Recycling today is an open loop. And what I mean by that is every actor, the consumer, the, uh, the uh, recycler, the manufacturer, the retailer, if we simplify it to say those actors, don't have to legally behave properly. So for example, today, as individuals, I can, if I litter something, I'm going to get fined. I'm not legally allowed to litter. But for some reason, I'm not going to get fined if I don't recycle properly. Then the recyclers, traditional recyclers, don't legally have to recycle what they collect. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Then manufacturers, you know, don't have to make their products from recycled material, nor make them recyclable. And same with retailers. So this is the challenge is that it's an open loop. And so it's fueled by convenience and motivation. We're going to recycle if it's easy. And maybe if we feel strongly about it, and maybe if there's a deposit or something, you know, attached to it, some incentive. Recyclers, and this is now what, what goes to the heart of it, recycle what they can make money on. Recycling companies are truly the way to look at them. And then everything will become very clear are urban miners. They're mining our garbage for value. And that's why aluminum cans are recycled all over the world at a very high rate. While something like uh, PET bottles, less so, uh, cartons even less so, and pouches even less so. All four of those things uh, in the world of beverage packaging, say aluminum cans, bottles, uh, cartons, and pouches are technically recyclable. They all can be. It's just they are progressively less profitable to recycle. And that's so important. So if we want recycling to, to, to thrive, we need to feed the waste, feed recyclers what makes economic sense for them to recycle, and then not be upset if we feed them stuff that's not good, that they're not going to want it. This is really, really important in thinking about how does it work? You know, from our point of view, to, to answer the balance of your question, we focus on the hard to recycle materials like the juice pouches, like cigarette butts, like dirty diapers, uh, to name a few, but hundreds of waste streams. Now, what makes, say, a coffee capsule, just to pick a random example, not recyclable is not that it can't, is that it costs more to collect and process and the results are worth. So in that example, we'll ask, would you fund recycling to make it free to citizens or retailers? Would you fund it? Or individuals, any stakeholder who's willing to, to fund it, we go seek that funding. And that allows us to then launch solutions where people can take part and recycle these things. And just to sort of, you know, really peel back the surface, take a coffee capsule that has aluminum in it, like an espresso pod, and compare that to an aluminum can. The aluminum can has a lot of aluminum. And aluminum is very valuable and it will self-fund, right? You don't have to fuel it. You could, uh, you know, there's enough value there. And it's pure aluminum. A coffee capsule is 97% coffee by weight, 3% aluminum. So the, the cost of collecting it and processing it will always be more than the subsidy of the aluminum. And so it requires an external stakeholder to fund it uh, to make it work. And that's the real essence of recycling. If you look at it like urban mining, then suddenly everything you know, becomes very clear on why it functions the way it does. And it's thriving. You know, we are recycling huge amounts of material in North America. But there's lots of products and packages that are just not economically valuable to recycle. And that's where organizations like ours come in to try to fill those gaps. So let me let me stop you there just a second, Tom, because this yeah. is fascinating. And and I think really gets at the heart, as you were saying, of, of where the disconnect is for people, right? Yeah. Like, so if you think about and I don't think people really think about recycling as a market, right? They're still in the waste brain rather than in the, this is a, 
a functioning, I love your terminology, a functioning mining business, right? And so you have to create incentivized, supported market for the product to make it worthwhile to recycle it into something new. That's right. That's right. A really simple way to think about this, just to really distill it. Let's say that I have a pile of used clothes, just for sake of conversation. I have like, a, I'm emptying out my closet and I have a hundred garments in there. Now, some of them may be ripped with holes inside. Some may be right. wildly out of style and some may be pretty awesome. Now, let's say, Jenny, you are a vintage store, a secondhand store. Now, you would look at my pile of garments and say, hey, look, that good stuff, I can resell it. And you know what? I'm going to put it on my shelf and I'm going to go resell it. But the rest, you're going to say, I have no market for this stuff. And so the only way that I could get you to resell it would be to pay you. And maybe what you do is you uh, you mend the, the clothing that uh, you know, has holes in it. That would cost you money. And maybe you cut up and re-sew the ones that are out of style to make them in style. And then you may be able to make sure all of those garments I gave you are going to be uh, uh, finding a new life. And so do you all do that work at TerraCycle? I know there's other groups. Four Days, right, is the one that's sort of spending a lot of money on marketing right now, yeah. um, where you sort of pay to send them your recycled goods. So you're supporting exactly the behavior that you're talking about, right? Like, yes. especially in that segment, right, which is... I wanted to pull up this statistic that someone shared with me yesterday. The Goodwill receives the equivalent of 19,000 blue whales worth of donated items every yes. year. That's that, that's right. And you know where that, like how does that break down, right? So if you think about today, all those bins we have, say in front of a place of worship or a school, you know, to put in, let's just take garments, but I have to know the data for that uh, quite well. And remember, let's look at our consumption. You know, a hundred years ago, you and I would have bought, on average, two apparel items per annum, and we would have used them for 20 years. That was in a world where we darned our socks, we cobbled our shoes. I mean, that, that's an art that's gone these days, right? Today, instead of two apparel items, you know, used on average for 20 years, we buy 77 apparel items and on average wear them three times before disposal. So you have this huge volume. Okay, so now we're putting a lot of this stuff, uh, this, you know, crazy after three wears into a goodwill or goodwill equivalent box. Now, what happens to all that material? It goes to a sorting center. And the stuff that can be resold in the United States, which is a very small percentage, because remember, this is the waste of the American public. It's not all going to be absorbed back in. It's going to be just the really good stuff. A few percentage points are resold in the US. And that's where we see vintage shops, secondhand stores, eBay, so on and so forth. Those companies are focused on the, on the really good stuff. Because if you're a thread up, you have to take the garment, photograph it, list it. If you're an eBay reseller, you're not going to do it for something that is not resellable. So then the balance is bailed in those ways, like put into big bricks and sold into emerging countries. Let's say Northern Africa, Eastern Europe, you know, places like that. There, it is resellers, you know, clothing resellers who are buying it. So let's say I was a clothing reseller in Romania. I'm buying this material from the U.S. Now, I'm buying bales of clothing. I don't know what's necessarily in it. Historically, what I know is about a third I can resell and about two thirds I won't be able to resell because maybe there's no market in my country for winter clothes or large sizes or just things that are maybe unique to the American market. And so what happens is a third is resold and then two thirds will probably be disposed in a very poor way, which is why we see all the horror stories of fast fashion ending up in uh, emerging countries and their landfills. So, for example, at TerraCycle, when, where we work um, on reuse and recycling, if we do reuse, because we have to, we legally guarantee that all the material will go to reuse, we only do closed loop reuse programs. So as an example on one, uh, we just launched a national cloth diaper service with Procter & Gamble, where you can get cloth diapers delivered to your home anywhere in the U.S., and you give us the dirties, we clean them and send them back. But there... All the diapers that come in, we legally must clean and send back. And if the if the diaper is um, beyond repair, then it will go into a recycling stream. So it's closed, right? It's not an open uh, loop. Otherwise, we do clothing recycling or we turn it into the stuffing for uh, athletic equipment like boxing gloves, uh, all the way to the stuffing for couches, because there we can guarantee that all of it will move into that direction. In both cases, we're effectively closing that loop. But as we zoom out, you know, to the clothing reuse example that you mentioned, that is how that system is set to work. It's not necessarily functioning incorrectly. It's just not necessarily the optimal solution for all of our clothing. 
And so it's not an optimized market at this point, right? Like there, no. there's room for optimization mm -hmm. in that recycle process experience that that is still immature in the market, right? If you wanted to get really sophisticated about the the market factors at play, yeah, um, that's where the opportunity is, and I think that's yeah. where you've been really successful. I, you know, I here at Keep America Beautiful, we've been a partner with you all yes. for 10 years That's right. in a really successful closed loop experience. And so maybe just for a minute, let's move from warm poop and dirty diapers and talk about cigarettes and specifically cigarette butts and our uh, shared cigarette litter prevention program, because it actually is exactly the model that you've been highlighting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think take cigarette butts, right? They are the most littered waste stream in 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 the world uh, i think if some statistics point at like uh, over a third of highway litter is cigarette butts now what's the big white elephant in the room here unfortunately what TerraCycle and what keep america beautiful does should not have to occur because people should stop smoking and this is very important in all of this conversation is we vote for these issues to occur as citizens with our money by buying these things and we have to note that is the genesis of almost every environmental issue. We're here talking about litter and waste. But if you if we were to talk about deforestation, uh, species diversity loss, uh, climate change, you pick the topic. Right. It always is the genesis is the act of consumption. And that is a direct cash vote for this to occur. Now, still today, no matter how much, you know, we would encourage folks not to smoke, a lot of the population smokes. And there's been incredible groups who are trying to curb that. But still, there's a lot of smoking out there. And uh, so we're thrilled. You know, this is our 10, 10th year anniversary. We started together in uh, 2013. Together, we have now collected and recycled um, just about a quarter billion uh, cigarette butts. And this is huge thanks really to all the folks on the ground in the various chapters who are running cleanups constantly. Without them, none of this would, would happen. And uh, what we're able to provide is picking up the cigarette butts, recycling them by shredding them, taking the ash tobacco paper and then composting that and taking the filter, which is made from a, a plastic, a polymer called cellulose acetate. And for anyone who doesn't know what cellulose acetate are, Jenny, if your glasses, the, the frames, the green component are made from a plastic, that is cellulose acetate. Uh, it's the exact same thing. And so we then recycle that into everything from ashtrays to industrial plastics and parts and so on. Quarter billion cigarette butts have uh, gone through this process in a, in a decade so far. And again, it's, I just want to really take this opportunity to thank everyone out there who's been actively collecting and part of this uh, overall movement. So we have to clean it up. And then let's also hope that folks uh, reconsider the act of smoking, maybe smoke a little less or quit altogether. Yes, we are ridiculously grateful. That is a lot of cigarette butts that are no longer near the waterways, in cities, on the ground, right? Because they are not biodegradable. It is That's plastic right. and it just That's is right. plastic in the ground and in our water. And we know that when we get people out there cleaning those uh, cigarette butts up and putting them in the bins that we send off to you at TerraCycle, we see a 50% reduction in the amount of litter on the ground in those areas, right? So yeah. it's working really well. And so I think, you know, the genesis for why this just continues to be a good idea year after year. So now they're all sitting in your offices there. What, what happens next yeah. in that process yeah. to close that loop? Absolutely. And uh, just before answering that very directly, I just want to say there's something interesting about litter and you touched on it in your in your statement is that when the streets are clean, they have a propensity to stay more clean. But when they are dirty, they have a propensity to get more dirty. Right. So it's so important to think about the message a clean street sends versus a dirty one. Because, look, if you're walking down a dirty street and you have something in your hand, there is maybe a higher chance that that may end up as litter than if you're the first piece of litter, right, on the street. But anyway, now to answer your question, right, so they come to, we have 35 different check-in facilities around the world where the uh, waste goes, where it's scanned, uh, we uh, track exactly where it came from, how much weight, and so on. Then from there, once we have enough butts together, we process cigarette butts probably on you know, every two weeks or three weeks, give or take. Then from there, we shred them and then separate out the ash tobacco paper from the filter. And the hard part here, the ash and, and tobacco can be is relatively easy, but we had to invent some special technology to get the filter, the paper off the filter itself. And to your point, you know, many folks think the filter, because it looks like a cotton or some sort of material like that is like a natural material. It is foamed plastic. And it's again, a type of plastic called cellulose acetate. 
which is a very high quality uh, plastic with flame retardant materials in it and so on. There's also, what's the point of the filter? You know, it came out as a way to uh, catch some of the carcinogens. So it has a lot of toxins in it. So we do a cleaning stage uh, to this uh, material. You know, when, when the cigarette butts come in, they're all quite dark and dirty, you know, because it's trapped all this uh, negative material. When they've left our process, it looks like a white fluff, if you will, almost like a cotton. And then from there, that gets pelletized and granulated. And then it goes into new applications. I have to coincidentally, here's an application. This uh, ashtray is made using the cigarette butts that we uh, that we collect. Now, of course, we're going to put into appropriate applications like cigarette butts into an ashtray. That's highly appropriate. It will not go into food grade applications. So it goes into a lot of industrial products, uh, automotive parts, uh, different things you may see in factories, all these different types of, of applications. I think we've been successful with you in places like Dollywood with the uh, Keep Tennessee River Beautiful that they actually end up as park benches. And you know what's nice about that is that the folks can see what their stuff turned into. And this is a well, really important thing in recycling is that many times we don't know what happens, right? And it's so wonderful when we can create projects where it's like that was cleaned up and here's exactly the object that it was turned into. And I think it also brings some pride to the folks that spent you know countless hours picking up all of this stuff off the streets. I think you're exactly right. And in fact, um, ISRI has some research that shows that people are more likely to recycle when they get to see the yeah. outcome, the products yeah. that come from the recycling process. And so uh, at Keep America Beautiful, we're spending a lot of time right now helping people see the outcomes of recycling. And so they can understand when it works, it does really amazing things with the resource that would otherwise be waste that's out there in the world. To build on that, um, if anyone's interested and really seeing, you know, the equipment and everything. Uh, if you go to the TerraCycle.com website, there's an, an search for cigarettes. You'll be able to see some videos on exactly what I've described, but see the equipment and what it gets turned into, the whole process. That's great. And we'll add those yeah. to the notes for the podcast. Yeah. You know, as usual, Tom, you and I can talk about this for yes. hours. Um, yes. And so we're coming to the end of our time, but would love to hear a little bit about like what's top of mind for you? What are you guys working on next? So our whole journey as an organization is how to continue to move from a linear to a circular economy and then as tight a circle as absolutely possible. So we talked today a lot about how do we recycle. A lot of, you know, after that, what we start thinking with companies, which is a much heavier uh, lift, is how do we help them start using waste streams to make their products? And this is a heavier lift because now it has to pass all the quality standards, all the different sort of capabilities. So we spend a lot of time there. And our favorite thing to do, and we're doing it now with a lot of really exciting companies, are closed loop applications. So we've, with Pilot Pens, recently launched a pen made entirely from used pens. Uh, with cosmetic companies, we've launched cosmetic packaging from cosmetic packaging. Uh, you'll see a lot of examples coming up uh, really soon, all the way to building all the Olympic podiums uh, from the Tokyo Games to the Games coming up in Paris very soon. But then the next step from there is how do we move from a con consumption that is based on disposability, where, of course, recycling and recycled content are the best things to do, to reusability, so that we yeah. don't have to produce waste whatsoever. And so we've put a lot of resource into launching Loop, which is our platform for reuse. That's now live in the United States, in France, and in Japan. And it's all about giving citizens the ability to buy their favorite products, whether it's uh, ice cream to ketchup, from laundry detergent to shampoo, filled already in reusable packaging, so that when you're done, you just drop it, not into a waste bin, but a reuse bin, and it gets cleaned and refilled, and around it goes again. And this is the journey we're pushing on is how to keep elevating so that as we consume things, we can have less impact. And ideally, I mean, if we move to a fully reusable world, there would be no litter, there would be no waste. Now that's a huge long journey, but that's what we're trying to really push for. And a journey we'd love to go on with you. So yes. Tom, thanks so much for your time today. And thank you for what you're doing with Keep America Beautiful and for the planet. We are uh, delighted to be your partner. And I just, as always, enjoyed this conversation today. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Tom for a great conversation. And now I am excited to share our next special guest in a reoccurring segment, my mom, Sally Kramer. She'll be joining me to ask those important recycling questions that each of us face when we're holding a pizza box, uh, a milk carton, a yogurt container. How do I recycle this? So she'll toss everyday questions our way and together we'll unravel the answers. Sometimes I'll know them and sometimes we'll have to go searching. 
So stay tuned because we could be addressing the very same questions that have puzzled you for years. What do we do with these light bulbs and batteries? Can they be recycled at all? So no, not really. Um, if it's a fluorescent, there are hazardous material in the fluorescents, huh. and those should go back to your home improvement stores. Most of the larger, the Home Depots, the Lowe's, they have um, they have the ability to take your light bulbs back. Uh, some of the more modern LEDs uh, don't have hazardous materials in them and either go in your trash can or also in many cases can go back to Lowe's or Home Depot uh, for for recycling. Your everyday batteries, you know, it depends. This is another one to look on your local waste management site. Um, ours, we're told to put them in the trash, which would go into the landfill. Uh, sometimes if they're lithium ion or rechargeable batteries, those go to that the sort of electronics hazmat pickup events that happen once or twice a year, usually yeah. in your community. Or uh, again, look at that materials place on your community's website. Very good. Thanks. Um, and I guess that would be the same for car batteries. Yeah. So car batteries are recycled by going to your local automotive uh, repair shop or, or store. They're actually highly recyclable and very recycled here in the U.S., which is great news. Wow. Yeah, it sure is. And that's a wrap for today's episode. I hope you gained insights into the world of recycling and the circular economy that we're all seeking to create. A heartfelt thank you to our Recycling Reality Check partners who have made this podcast possible. For more information on those partners and for upcoming episodes, please visit us at kb.org. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.